Good afternoon. I'm Colonel Jason Harris, your Mission Support Group Commander here at Edwards Air Force Base. And on behalf of General Heiger, I'd like to welcome you to today's, <laughs> sorry, getting camera cues, today's school uh, town hall. And I'm joined today by the Murad uh, <laughs> District Office. Uh, we have Kevin Cortez, the superintendent, uh, Brent Tan, Kevin Walker, and then we have the two principals, or Trevor Walker, sorry, <laughs> I don't know why I called you Kevin Walker, Trevor Walker. Um, we have the two principals, Dr. Elms and uh, Principal Sierks. So before we get started uh, with questions, um, we have off camera Chief Thompson, um, your superintendent for the MSG, taking the questions. Uh, but before we take those, I'm going to open up the floor to, uh, to Kevin and see, see what he's got to say. A Thank lot of questions, I'm sure. A lot. There's a lot. Um, and thanks for hosting this. We always appreciate um, these town halls and the opportunity to speak. We have, uh, I hope that people know at home that you know, every week we do videos for parents and we do videos for staff. Um, they are as informative as we can make them and keep them not only relevant, but also um, feel that we can share information that we have confidence will not change within the next seven days. Um, and so I just want to express on behalf of all of us um, your patience and we appreciate you working with us. So even since we, we uh, broadcasted last week, there have been some pretty significant adjustments to how mm -hmm. school will look when we come back on April the 12th. Um, first, I'd like, before I address those, I want to go back and talk about a couple things that I've heard from community members um, all over. A big question that we get is, why are we coming back to school when um, we're so close to the end of the school year? Mm -hmm. We all wanted to go to school when it was the beginning of the year. Um, we didn't want to have to go into a distance learning mode. Um, but uh, the way that California is structured and the way the laws were, that's what we had to do. So I get asked quite a bit, um, not as much now as we've tried to get word out, but still there are those that wonder, why now? We're coming up on the fourth, we're in the fourth quarter of school, we're the, kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Why would, we, oh, why would we even open up at this point? Why not just continue where we're at? Um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion in the media and with um, the governor's office and legislature, and they've talked a lot about money, and I don't want anybody to mistake that the district is trying to chase some dollars, and so we're going to put kids in school, and um, the only reason we're doing that is to get some money. There's actually been um, some mandates by the governor that students get back to school in some capacity. There's some flexibility, but when you dig into the law and who they expect to come back to school, it is all of the groups that are considered unduplicated in California. So those are any students that are English language learners. Those are any students who may be foster or homeless. And those are any students who would qualify for free and reduced lunches. And then after that, there's a, a series of things that they posted. They said any student who has, um, has a social emotional problem um, they've been affected socially or emotionally mm -hmm. by COVID-19. They need to get back into school. Any student who has a home life that is essentially detrimental to them and um, school is their safe place, you need to get them back. And then uh, a few other little, little areas and then a line that talks about how essentially any student who has been negatively impacted um, due to COVID-19, academically or otherwise. So there is now an argument that any child, any student, you could say, falls into that category because everybody has been affected by COVID. So I cannot speak for other school districts, and I try to be very careful to not look like I'm disparaging our neighboring school districts or anybody else in the state. I will say that when we went out a year ago, um, last March, the governor was the one who made it very clear that all schools will go go home, you're done, you're closing your doors. Coming back, there has been a greater push for you guys figure this thing out amongst yourselves, you do it in your way, 
And there have been so many different proposals by the governor and others um, in the legislature about how this might look that we have created plan after plan and idea after idea. We've even made a few announcements about what we thought we were going to do and had to absolutely recant all of that and retool and rethink what we needed to do. So with the passage of AB, I believe it's 86, forgive me if I just said that wrong, but it's Assembly Bill and Senate Bill. They did it jointly, <coughs> 86. They, they put together $64 billion, I want to say, um, or 46.4, forgive me. Once we're into the billions, <coughs> we reach a point where it's kind of, yeah. Um, but there are, there's about $46.4 billion. And it's in different pots of money, and it's for different reasons. And some of it is to safely get kids back. And the governor said, we want students back by April 1st. Depending on the colored tier that you were in, you had to bring back certain students. We figured that by the time April 1st rolled around, we would still be in the purple tier. That's what we thought. And a week later, we said, we might actually be in the red by the time April 1st comes. Mm -hmm. And a week after that, we said, we'll definitely be in the red. And now here we are, we're, at, we're in the red tier. Purple tier to red tier means that you go from talking about just elementary students to talking about, and a grade level at junior, senior high school to you're talking about all students. From the beginning, we said, if we're going to bring back some kids, let's bring them back and let's do it. Let's, let's do the most that we can for kids as safely as we possibly can. So the dollars were going to be there regardless. Now, we could either use them to bring back kids safely, or we could be forced to bring kids back and not have access to those funds. I'm going to ask Trevor to speak to some things here in a few moments, but I also want to stress to parents and the community that the money that is being set aside for this um, consists of some money, in fact, a large portion of it, that is already owed to school districts that the state is deferring on. So rather than pay us money that they owe us, they are holding those monies back. And now they have said, we have created some new funding for you to bring kids back safely. At the end of the day, the real money we're going to get is money we were supposed to receive anyway. There's not a large, extra, humongous windfall of money that's falling into the, our school district or really anyone else. But that being said, um, with the rules in place and to bring kids back um, by that April 1st deadline, we made a few adjustments to spring break because the way they wrote the language made it appear at the time that if you took any break after April 1st, that you would be fined some serious money. Mm -hmm. They've clarified that since, um, and it doesn't look as bad as they originally posted. And I think that's because a number of districts threw a, a fit and said, how, can, how dare you make up a law like that whenever we've had a calendar that has our spring break past April 1st. Nevertheless, we made the adjustment, and what we did was we added two days to the beginning of spring break. We'll have those two days at the end of the school year. The academic calendar year must be 180 school days. That's law. So we can't just take two days away magically. Um, once we put those days on um, in order to, at that time, save what we were told was going to be upwards to almost $50,000, um, we had to tack those to the end of the year. So thank you for your patience with that. High schools are still looking at graduations that are similar to what they were planning. We, we tend to hold our senior graduations technically before the end of the school year. And uh, we do that for families. We, we're very sensitive to how PCS works, uh, especially at Edwards and with summertime. And even if people aren't PCSing, they, they have a lot of plans or they're planning to do things. So um, the reason that we're coming back to school is because the governor said get back to school. So next we looked at how do we do it the best, safest way possible. Um, from the beginning, the way that we've done things is we tried to bring everybody in the school district together. We sent many surveys home to parents so that we could hear from parents and from students. Um, and then we got our staffs together. And we got together work groups and we talked about what is the safest way to do this. 
we didn't feel that Trevor Brent and I didn't think, even though we've been at school sites, even though I've been a school teacher, uh, I've been a custodian, I've been a groundsman, and a maintenance guy, and a teacher, and a principal at every school district, every school in the district, even I didn't feel like I'm the, the great expert in world pandemics. <coughs> uh, that tab is not located in any book that I ever went through, and so we're all trying to figure out how to do this. So we started with our cohorts of our team players um, that consisted of people like yard duty aides and secretaries and teachers, bus drivers, and we got people together and said, how can we do this in the safest way? What do you think? We have some plans, let's poke holes in it. They built plans, um, and we also looked at what is the state allowing. So when I met last week, um, I talked about how high school is gonna follow a collegiate model. A lot of colleges have been, and universities have done this. They set up a single camera, teachers at the front of the room, they teach a lesson, regardless of whether you're distance learning from home or elsewhere, or if you're physically in the class, you get to see the lesson, and you participate and, and you move forward. Um, the way that we'll do that is the teacher will dedicate time every day during the period at some point to be able to communicate with those students that are at home. So if they have questions, if they have concerns, they'll still have time every period to touch base with their teacher, um, some measure of time. All of our teachers have been very flexible in their time and working with kids um, at all times. Um, elementary school, what I said last week was, depending on the decision that parents would make for their child, they would either be in a distance learning model with a distance learning teacher that, um, or they would be at school with the teacher, um, with a teacher. And that depending on how many students came to school would determine if there was a teacher change or combination classes. <clears throat> we have changed our direction on this. We feel as, as a district, as teachers and as, min, as administrators, that the best thing for students at elementary school is to stay with their teacher. So they're gonna stay with their teacher for the remainder of the year, regardless if a parent feels comfortable sending their child to class physically, or if they choose to continue to stay home and have their child on a Chromebook and participate in that way. Now it's hard to do a collegiate model in kindergarten. It gets easier as you get to the upper grades, but it's still at elementary school that looks different. Every teacher um, is going to spend at least 30 minutes a day with the students that are doing distance learning. Some teachers have expressed that they plan to do multiple hours. It depends on the teacher, the grade level, how they structure their class. We have always been very flexible with, especially with parents here at Edwards who need to do something called short-term independent study. That's where maybe you've been deployed and you come home and now you're home and you and your family wanna go take a couple of, of weeks together or you're about to be deployed and you wanna take some time together or there's been a crisis in your family or for whatever reason, you just say, I need to pull my child out of school for at least five days and what we do is we give you some work to do and you bring that work back and that equates to essentially being at school. I need parents who are going to, th to do distance learning to think of life as, as uh, that kind of an environment where it's distance learning or, or it's, it's um, um, independent study but with a huge caveat, and that is you get daily access to your teacher and your child still gets to communicate with their peers every day. Minimum's 30 minutes, but many are gonna do much more than that um, or do more than that. So um, we're trying to feel this out as well. And what we found was there's a really hard decision to make for families and it was a hard way to build it as a school district. As I would talk to families and I would ask, just even informally, I'd ask a parent, what do you plan to do? You have three children, what do you plan to do? They would say, you tell me what you plan to do. I'd say, well, I'll know what I'm gonna do once I know how many kids are gonna come. And, they, and then they would say, well, I'll tell you if I'm sending my kid once I know how many kids are coming and how many distance teachers you'll have and how many in-person teachers you'll have. And I'd say, and I can't tell you that until I know how many of you are coming. And we just kind of did this round, round robin. 
Well, we didn't feel that was, at the end of the day, that's not the best thing for kids. And parents don't want that either. So even at elementary school, um, we form bonds. I taught third grade when I was a teacher, and I loved my third graders. And especially three quarters of the way through the year, the thought of giving up some of them to some other teacher would have been heartbreaking for me. Um, and our teachers want to be with those kids as much as the kids like being with their teacher. So um, I just want to announce this evening that that part will stay the same. Um, it will look different if you're doing the distance learning. I'm trying to get rid of the word hybrid because hybrid means too many things to do too many people. And every school district's using it differently. So I don't want to use hybrid and have a misunderstanding. You're either distance learning or you're in person. We plan to do everything to keep you safe. We just spent all day today, all of us, with a group of students, our own children, and some other students of employees in the district, going to every school site in the district and filming everything from a bus stop in Boron to what it looks like when you get on the bus. How you get on the bus, where you sit on the bus, how you get off the bus at school, to how you come into the school building itself and you get your temperature checked, um, how you do that on base at each of the schools, how you do it in high school, what does cafeteria look like, what does the playground look like, what does a classroom look like. We're trying to give a picture to, the, to you as parents as far as what that's going to look like. And then ultimately we're all going to come back and we're going to make some adjustments and we're going to do everything that we can what's, to do what's best for kids. So that's the reason that we're coming back. Um, there's a few reasons that we're doing it in the way that we're doing it. I talked about this last week. First and foremost, the, the reason that we're coming back five days a week from in a traditional model is we feel it's what's best for kids. That having a child have the opportunity, if you're comfortable, to come in and be with their teacher or teachers and see them and their peers is the best thing for them. Second is for you as families that it provides the most consistent thing for you. We understand, especially here for parents at Edwards, that you work for different uh, contractors on base or your active duty and perhaps <clears throat> your employers got you working some different shifts. Um, that your, your work model doesn't look the same as it did before COVID. Um, nevertheless, we feel that this provides at least a consistent model of what kids will do rather than, all right, it's Tuesday. What am I, what is my kid doing this Tuesday? Or, okay, it's, it's morning or afternoon. Or what are we doing this week? It's, it's a consistent model. Next, it's what parents asked for in the survey the most. It's what our staff asked for the most in the survey. It won out hands down out of all of the other models that, that we presented. Um, we feel that moving forward, by the time fall comes, the way things are going, you're gonna see schools look traditional again. I really hope so at least. I hope there's not another wave. I hope that right. we don't have another COVID situation. But if everything holds the way it's moving, we see that schools will look like this anyway. So why not do it now, practice it, figure out how to do it the best way, hit the ground running in the fall. And then the fifth and final reason um, is that there's a lot of society that's built around the way a school is operated. Our, our youth center programs are actually built around a work day and a school schedule. Um, a lot of babysitters, a lot of people that provide childcare do that around a regular school schedule. As we started looking at, do we do AM or PM? And one of my first calls was to Colonel Harris to ask what's the capacity at the youth center if I just released essentially half of Branch Elementary School at 11 AM into Edwards Air Force Base. Could, could Edwards handle that? Those are questions really outside of our control. And at the end of the day, I couldn't even tell you how many kids I was really talking about because we were doing that circle talk about, I'll tell you if I'm sending my kid when you tell me the plan. And I'm saying, I'll tell you the plan when you tell me if you're sending your child. So um, by keeping the kids coming five days a week, keeping their teacher, we feel ultimately it's the best thing. 
I have now talked so long, I don't like the sound of my own voice. But you gave me an opportunity to speak, and I feel that these are some of the questions people probably have. Oh, absolutely. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to ask Brent and Trevor, what have I missed? What should I talk about? What do we want to make sure parents um, understand? I'll just kind of piggyback on what you said in regards to special education, where the one thing we really want is to bring back our kids five days a week in a traditional setting, kind of like Kevin Cortez said. You know, the big thing is we want our students to start, start building routine again. Um, being able to come in, interact with students, get that social emotional support, getting that in-person um, specialized academic instruction. These are all things we really want to emphasize. Our number one priority and concern too is closing that gap. Um, I know Kevin kind of touched on it in regards to learning loss mitigation. That is one emphasis of the state. Um, that we really try to close that gap in regards to distance learning and being away for so long. Um, so that's something that is a priority to us, as well as the health and safety too. Um, so that's kind of just what I wanted to add um, to that. Okay. Yeah, and one important thing to add, we talked a little bit about the money, is more and more we're being told from a lot of the, the groups that monitor the legislature and the 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 goings on at the Capitol on what, where is the state going and what, what's gonna be the expectation. And more and more it looked like we're going to reach the point where whether we accept the funds or not, we might still end up being forced to come back to school. If we are forced to come back to school, we didn't accept the funds, then some of the things that we have to buy, like the barriers and the stickers, those things add up to really quite substantial amounts of money. Um, and to walk away from the funds to reopen and then find ourselves forced to reopen, we would then be taking general fund money, the money we use to provide additional instruction and day-to-day, -day, make sure we have enough teachers. We'd be having to make cuts to the, just the core program when students need more than ever before to just try and come back. So for, uh, for the district to make sure we had the resources to just do what we normally do, um, it, the writing really was on the wall where we needed to act and uh, we, we could see that pressure building and we could see the, the, the politics in the background leading us that direction. Uh, we absolutely, um, I think one of the things we, we talked around, uh, it is absolutely not an easy decision. Um, again, we, we convened work groups, we asked parents, we took all the, all the data we had, we, can, we discussed the, these with the, the state, with local health departments, looked at CDC guidance to figure out where are the risks and what are the risks and, and that's a balancing act and based on what our community felt, what our experts through the, through the community and from the state told us, we made the, the decision to come back and reopen. And there's going to be some that don't agree with it, some that aren't sure, and some that are ecstatic. And, and for those who aren't sure, we hope we can show you. We, we've put a lot of effort uh, as a district, as a community, into making sure the students are as safe as possible. And for those that think it's crazy, you absolutely have that distance learning option. Um, and we hope that as you see, you see how careful and how mindful and how safe and how much time and energy we'll spend not just on the sites, uh, but also really helping to train the kids. Uh, we don't, we, we hope in fall we come back to some semblance of normal, but the reality and expectation is we will see some changes in society for quite a while. And this will really be that first big push when they come out to, to larger groups to be mindful, to keep your distance, make sure your mask is on right, all those things that uh, we are getting there and getting used to and now the students are gonna come and, and get that and get that um, experience here in the schools. All students will be masked every day. Mm -hmm. um, not only is there a requirement that they'll be masked, we are going to hold a very strict standard to that. Let me tell you one of my concerns, and I'm gonna ask the parents to help me on this. <clears throat> Here's my concern. High schoolers, um, I was a high schooler, and I, didn't tr I wouldn't trust me when I was in high school, and there's a lot of high schoolers that I, I, uh, I fear are going to do this. They're excited. They've been away from each other for a long time. And I, I fear this picture I have in my mind where there's a group of four or five teenagers, their faces are all pressed together, they're smiling huge, and somebody's taking a selfie and they're saying, you know, 2021, or it's great to be back, or whatever, and it goes on social media, and it's at school, 
and parents feel like, wow, the district's doing a, just an outstanding job of taking this seriously. We have talked with our staff about this. Um, we will be holding students very accountable when it comes to wearing masks and following social distancing guidelines. Um, we have recommendations and directions from the CDC. It does allow us to keep our students um, cl in close enough proximity to provide the classes and keep everyone safe. We have plans in place for students to be routed so that in high school they go directionally, for example. Um, elementary school, they're in their own cohort because they just live there. Uh, basically, but we, we've thought about all of these different things that I know that parents are going to be concerned about. And if students are going to violate them, we can easily slide them back into distance learning. If there is a child or if there is an outbreak and somebody does test positive for COVID, there are guidelines for that that have been established by the CDC and by the state. We will, depending on the situation, we will definitely, if it's in a class, that class transitions into distance learning. Um, and they're able to continue learning that way. They keep their teacher. Um, I, I know I've been asked this, and then they'll quarantine for 14 days, and they'll have the opportunity to come back. We are going to hold graduations. We have opened up some sports. Um, the mental health piece on this has been weighing on my mind significantly. Um, we have had a, just a humongous increase in social, emotional distress by students. Um, and some by adults. And we have felt it, I felt it in my home. Um, we have experienced it as well. And we have seen some, we've had some very tragic events and things that have occurred um, locally and in the last year. And getting them back to school and being around one another. And we will have safeguards in place. We have counselors, we have wraparound services. Um, we have those in place for students to be able to, to be able to talk and to have a, a place to be heard and a way to feel safe. And I will now entertain any questions anyone has. I just wanted to make sure I covered some of those, Chief. Okay. Yeah. Before, right before we do that, you guys mentioned you're filming and you keep a pretty good battle rhythm to mm -hmm. post your. Um, your videos every Friday. Every so Friday. The filming you did today is that going to be ready tomorrow? Or the we filming today will mix? not be ready tomorrow. Okay. We have we have a little <laughs> bit more uh, uh, footage that I have to get through gotcha. and, and edit. Uh, most likely, we'll be looking early next week um, okay. for these for our return to schools and for for parents that are really curious right now what that looks like. You can go you can go onto our YouTube uh -huh. and you can see the re the return to school for the SDR classes. Uh, what you'll see. Today, uh, you'll see in the, the upcoming video for all students is, a, is just that type of style of video showing really just what, what is a new day in the life? What are, what are some of the kind of the sticking points like coming to school, eating lunch, just to show the students, show the parents what we're doing and how we're, we're handling it. Um, and so you, you can get a, a pretty good idea. Most of those, most of the uh, precautions and the procedures in those videos are similar. There are some changes, uh, as we mentioned, it changes pretty rapidly, but uh, that will give you a pretty good idea of what to expect and then, um, yeah, I think. Awesome. And on top of that, our safety plan that we've submitted with the state is posted on a website. Mm -hmm. We tried to be absolutely transparent throughout all of this. It talks about um, we're installing handless um, mm -hmm. sanitation um, pumps. So instead of pumping on something, you know, that mm -hmm. everybody touches, it's handless hand sanitation, mm -hmm. uh, or I mean, touchless hand sanitation. Um, we are, we've updated the, the filters. We've mm. also added some air ionization units, and we're adding those into mm. every single um, HVAC unit. And we have a couple of rooms that still have swamp cooler. Um, in the old branch, mm. where Desert is currently gonna be housed mm. right now um, for the next two years, even in those units, um, we can have those. We're using fresh air. Um, we're doing everything that we've been asked to do, and then mm. we have added a bunch of other things on top of that mm. because it's the right thing, and um, just as a reminder, uh, our students go here. John has kids that go here, Trevor's kids go here, mine go here, Brent's got one daughter, Everly, she starts kindergarten in the fall, she'll be here. Um, Dave's kids are all grown up, so <laughs> these aren't here. 
But I mean, <laughs> just, just a reminder that our children attend these schools too, and my children have attended the schools on base as well, and our kids mm -hmm. attend schools on the base. And anyway, um, we're, we're parents as well as employees of the district. Roger that. Okay. All right, Chief, what do we got first? Uh, so we have a lot of questions. Some of these questions you guys have already touched on. Uh, I can ask you to keep in mind that you've already touched on them. Keep your answers kind of brief, but it's also somebody asked a question and they may not have heard uh, within the first uh, a set of, yeah, but the first set of minutes, not caught everything. Okay. So first question is fairly, fairly easy. It's a softball. Will our children be able to play football again or at least participate in physical conditioning to keep them active? They need physical activity. 100% answer. Yes, physical activity and working back towards football. Um, we are doing softball. We're trying to find a baseball coach right now for desert. Um, we're having a hard time. We can't find any person. We are doing cross country. But for the next season, yes, and conditioning at any time, absolutely. Um, that is an absolute yes. And I have stressed that this year I need everybody to remember this is 90% mental health and we are playing a sport more than we are per than we are um, competing. competing in the sport. Thank you. Excellent. Next question, kind of a two-part, but it sits on something um, that I've already been mentioned a little bit. Are kids going to be able to warm up food in the cafeteria? Does or no? Do the kids or will the kids be able to eat inside or outside of the cafeteria? And do you provide lunch? So we we will have the opportunity to heat food up in the cafeterias. Um, so that, well, that's always been an option and will remain an option. Uh, I, I will say from a safety standpoint, we actually don't love it because, um, you know, a kindergartner with a giant cup of boiling noodles in a styrofoam cup is a little, a little harrowing sometimes. Uh, but we will absolutely be there to support it. We are serving meals. We will actually try and eat out, outside more when we can. Uh, it's probably not a bad thing health-wise anyways. But we will, we will encourage that. However, the cafeterias will be open. There will be there in the cafeterias. We can, with, even though the CDC has reduced some of the guidance on how close students can be, it's when you're masked. So in the cafeterias, they will have to remain six feet apart because at that moment, they are going to have to unmask. Um, and we'll be very aggressive in the cafeterias and making sure that they, they maintain that distance since they are unmasked eating. And, we, and great trends. Mm -hmm. and adding tables to do that. Mm -hmm. So I, if I was a parent, I'd say, well, how in the world are you going to fit them in there? Well, we're adding tables and more chairs, too. Yeah. We're maximizing space. May John? I also add on that? So mm -hmm. we also have these two beautiful brand new schools with mm -hmm. lots of great outdoor space, and we are lucky that we have a lot of really good weather here on base. Mm -hmm. And so the, we will be eating outside. I'm going to be encouraging eating outside mm -hmm. uh, for, for uh, as much as possible. Yeah, the grass over space. there, Absolutely. it looks like a golf course, so it is beautiful. Uh, it'll be yes, nice to sit outside yes. and, and enjoy a meal. It'll be great. Well, that's a great segue into the next question. How are you going to enforce distancing between TK and K students, between TK students independently and K students independently? How are you going to enforce distancing in those situations? We have a lot, we have a, a lot more supervision. Um, we, we will be just encouraging and reminding. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're kids. My, my own child is, is a kindergartner and I have to tell him 40 times a day. Um, but you know, that's, that's what we do. Um, we have to just keep reminding and they do get better at it. They do, they do improve and um, we, will, we will do the, our absolute best mm -hmm. to constantly remind and keep, keep them spaced. In our tour today, I, I think I remember us having uh, tri-partitions we do. For inside the classroom, you can mm -hmm. set up the little tri partitions. Many of our folks may have seen on the news. Uh, we, from have other those. Per I, we purchased 2,000 of We have about 1,700 students. We purchased 2,000. Um, every student has one. We have uh, talked about them in the past. They're in the video that we shot today. Okay. Um, there's also pictures of whole classes of them uh, <clears throat> as well, and they will stay on a desk and be able to mm -hmm. stay in there, and that's, uh, that's another thing. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've done that. Um, as well. Excellent. Okay, next next question, a little bit in a different direction. Uh, what will the two additional days of school look like at the end of this year, meaning June 4th and June 7th? I noticed uh, they're different color on the school calendar. Will it be like 2019 where the last two days didn't really count anyway? No, they're going to count. Let's be honest. At the end of the, as the year wraps up towards the end of the year, we we push hard at, hard at the beginning um, and throughout the school year. Those last few days are when we can reserve time, though, to have um, have some more fun activities and some other things. There'll still be 
there'll, there'll still be relative days to send your children to school, absolutely. They will not look like the 15th day of school, for example. Nothing does. The last day of school didn't when we were kids, and it's not going to look different this year, and it won't look different 10 years from now. But right. they will be relevant, absolute relevant days, yes. Mm -hmm. The days that I think that person is referring to is uh, we were caught on a minor technicality, and we were asked to have an additional day, and I think we had, um, I know at one school site, we had eight kids show up, and that was it. Mm -hmm. So that's not what this is. This is literally moving two days over. They'll still be good. good so it feels, starts to feel that way at the end of every school year, right? Yeah. It really does. People start on vacation early and what have you. Yeah. Um, same kind of vein. When is spring break exactly? The calendar says 5 through 9th. Where are the two days added to? Where were the extra two days added? The calendar should represent accurately on the website. I apologize if it doesn't. It begins on the 1st of April. Which is a Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, Friday. Thursday, Friday, and then the entire next week that was already planned. So the, the extra two days that they're not seeing, they're seeing the 5th through the 9th, but probably not seeing the 1st and 2nd colored in. I, I guess not. And yeah. I thought the calendar was updated. My apologies if it's not. We will update it tomorrow. Okay, and I, I think we hit this already, but it extends into recess as well. It says, what is the lunch process going to look like going back and forth to the cafeteria in recess? Mm -hmm. And I think the way they meant, as you guys mentioned earlier, we may be going in waves or in heats in a local, but a little bit different mm -hmm. that way for safety purposes. Okay. Yeah, you'll see pacings a little bit different that way. We, we control how, who's, who's in there. We'll probably be a, a little more regimented in, in the cafeteria so kids sit, you eat, and then you go outside. Uh, it's less about social time inside with your, your classmates. One thing that is going to break some people's hearts, I want to say it now just to get it done, and I, and I hope people will understand, is that in the past we've had some parents come and eat lunch with their students every day at the elementary level especially. In order to preserve safety for students, we are not going to allow that for the remainder of this year. Um, the students will, will have lunch with their peers, mm -hmm. but not parents coming to the school. And the reason for that is just the same reason that I can't go and I couldn't go in when my son had surgery. I couldn't go in and see him, sure. right? There's been a lot of adjustments like right. that. On that. In that same vein that they can't go in and eat, but let's say Johnny forgot his lunch today. They, yes. Can they drop off lunch? 100%. Okay. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. So no food and water, no bread and water. No bread and water. No okay, just making sure. And, and in order to help watch the students, we have added a number of temporary positions. That's part of the funding that has come. So um, I can tell you that for Branch and Bailey alone, if you add all the little t all the times together, it's 27 different positions that have been added, just to, just to add bodies onto the campus in order to monitor students and to keep them from congregating together. It's going to be so hard because they want to be close to each other, but they do have to keep a little distance from one another as they play. Right. On that note, we are hiring, so if you're if you would like a job, part time work, uh, go, <laughs> go on and join and apply. Perfect. Perfect audience for, yeah. for that. Yeah, we would love to have parents come and earn some money, and if you wanted to come and be with your child on campus and I just ruined your day, come on over and I'll pay you to be there. <laughs> Sounds like a good post-retirement job. Mm -hmm. I might see you soon. Okay, <laughs> what, does the, what does the social distance look like for Desert Junior Senior High with them moving to Branch Elementary? Will they be required to carry their books and laptops to each class as we're used to seeing? Mm -hmm. Will students in Desert and Junior and Senior High be required to sanitize their area prior to moving to the next class? And if so, will this cut in the learning time? So basically, are they carrying their stuff with them to each and every class before they leave a class? Or are they sanitizing the desk and will that cut in the learning time? We do have some extended time in between. California reduced the number of instructional minutes that was required. We have tried to not do that. We tried to keep them, so we technically are well above the, the minimum instructional minutes. While yes, it does cut in, it does take 30 seconds or so to take, but what we're gonna ask is every student before they leave at the very end of the period will take, it, it is, a, a safe and approvable um, mm -hmm. wipe, basically, and wipe down the desk in their area and leave the room. And then when the students come in, the very first thing, while it's still before the bell is finished ringing and they're setting up for the day, they will wipe the same, they'll wipe their own area. So mm -hmm. everything gets hit two times. At night, it's completely different, where it gets a, a heavy cleaning, um, all the surfaces, and throughout the day, we'll have custodians that are on site during the day that are constantly hitting bathrooms, 
doorknobs, mm -hmm. regularly touched areas, that's on top. But just that question was about the student desk mm -hmm. area. And does it cut into learning? You could argue that a lot of things cut into learning. Mm -hmm. Their safety will cut into learning, mm -hmm. yes. A little bit on that one, I, I would say. Yeah, and there's so there's no lockers over there, so there students will have to carry their mm -hmm. books. Yeah, we've been working five. together with the teachers to try to do as much as we can digitally uh, with what the books. The teachers are aware that they have to carry the books, so whatever teachers tell you, if they need to bring in the books, they'll have to carry it. They'll have the Chromebooks with them as well, so they will have to carry that in. Excellent. Um, also, I, I can follow up real quick, quick with the learning minutes. It's going to be the same schedule we've been having the whole year. So it's still going to be the 50 minutes um, additional time in the mornings to help with tutoring and learning loss mitigation is the new term now. Um, but we also have, because this is actually a longer, bigger campus than we were used to. So it's longer to get to classes. We have a 10 minute passing period instead of five. So there's extra time you know, for that cleaning and everything else as well. Lockers are a controversial thing. Lockers are not built into new schools. Across the nation, lockers have been pulled out for a long time. And um, the number one reason for lockers being removed has to do with the increased number of violent um, school shootings. Um, it's a place to store all sorts of paraphernalia that should not belong at school. And yes, while it does increase um, the amount of weight that a student perhaps has to carry, as we transition and look at new books and materials, um, a lot of those have transitioned into digital learning and we're doing the same. Boron High School was rebuilt um, a year and a half ago and there are no lockers at Boron High School. And there aren't any lockers that are planned for the new desert. So um, if you wanna go ahead and start yelling at me about that, that's fine. Um, but lockers have been pulled out for a number of reasons and I would rather have students carry heavy objects um, if that's what it took then to deal with the things that we find. We've had drug dogs and we've worked you know, for years having drug dogs come and find all sorts of things and invariably um, a lot of things wind up in lockers that have no business being on a campus. It helps with security, it helps with cleanliness and um, we are looking to move as digitally as we can as we move forward. Cool. And then just jump ahead in case a question comes up as far as class sets of textbooks. If we had that, we'd have to sanitize the books between each period and using a wet sanitizer on the books, those books wouldn't last very long. So right now we're not doing the class sets. Cool. Makes sense that that tracks. Okay, um, roughly what percent of the high schoolers will be in person after, after April 12th? Secondarily, and I'm not sure this is really the form for this one, but I'm going to put it out there in case one of you know, and I've been in a meeting where you heard it. Is it known when our under 16 year old children will be able to get vaccinated? I know it is early and not to play the what if game, but will distance learning be allowed next year? Uh, a lot of questions there. The first one again, again, Chief. Roughly please. what percentage, do we know what percentage of high schools are going to return um, until April? We have people declared. I we have will, a survey going out tomorrow. To we parents. have a survey going out to find that answer there out. There we yeah. go. So we have a survey going out to find that out. And um, will, that, will we know where that will be reported? Will that be on the next video we release? It will, will be. As soon as we have it, I'll put it out on the video. And then also next week, um, um, we'll ask the elementary teachers to do the same for each one of their classes just cool. so that we can get an idea. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we will survey the parents. I know that a lot of parents were waiting to find out from things like this and also other videos what we were planning yeah, to absolutely. do. Things have now changed so much because we went to the red tier that no longer do we need to have that plan that's been posted approved by the state or county. It is now done, it's good. And uh, we'll have, um, we need to have the board approve it and that's all that we have to do. Nice. So we can move forward with the plan that we have presented. We no longer have to wait for any outside entity to come to us and tell us that we uh, need to do something different. So and vaccines, I can't, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I don't know anything about vaccines. Mm -hmm. We have not been told that we have to require vaccines. Mm -hmm. We do not require vaccines. Vaccines are left up to parents. Now in the state of California, there are some other things outside mm -hmm. of COVID that have been required. That's not what's being discussed now, I know, and I don't know of anything, I haven't heard anything under 16 years old for vaccines, but I'm probably not the best person to ask about that anyway. Yeah, I, I think I heard on the news they're doing a study between ages five to 12 to see the efficacy of how that might, might but I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon where we'd have results to you know, force I, I our, believe, have our kids do um, it. And this is just from a podcast um, from the Wall Street Journal I listened to, 
they had mentioned that high school students may potentially be eligible to get a vaccine in the fall, and then in early 2022, you might look at elementary age students. Um, now, don't quote me on it. I can't promise, you know, I heard this in a podcast, but um, it is a reputable podcast, and I believe it came from, from, um, uh, from the CDC. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But, uh, and, and on the topic of vaccinations, one thing I do, it is worth noting, uh, we have ensured that all of our staff have had the opportunity to get both doses of the vaccine prior to returning to school as well. Um, just as another measure of protection. Um, so you mentioned the survey that you're sending out mm -hmm. um, on whether or not they're coming back. If a parent sees, you know, once you announce the results, mm -hmm. parent sees, whoa, that's too many kids going back. I don't feel comfortable. I said yes mm -hmm. in the survey, but mm -hmm. now I don't want to do that. They can change their mind. They can change their mind. And they can <coughs> go the other way. Mm -hmm. And at elementary school, by okay. keeping the teacher, it allows that. What I talked about last week is the only thing I can't allow is vacillating back and forth constantly. Right. Um, you kind of have to get into it. I could see, in the example that I used with our staff was I could see a, a student that starts off distance learning with a parent. They see that it actually is going okay. I think I feel comfortable. A week later, they send their student in and then some kind of a tragedy happens. There's an emergency, family emergency and they're leaving the state and they say, I now need to pull back out. That's fine to do. Mm -hmm. But just going back and forth is way too complicated for us to keep up right. with. And I also can't have, well, it works for me on, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work for me on that Monday, Wednesday. And so on those days, I'd like to do the, the other way. You got to go one route or the other. Um, it's too complicated <laughs> to track both ways. So gotcha. we, we just need to make a decision and move forward. But of course, if somebody changes their mind, they'll have the opportunity to come out. We just can't bounce, 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 bounce. Right. That makes sense. Um, when will the annex have the capacity for after school care? This is the biggest limiting factor to our schedule as parents once kids return. Good question and I'm glad we got help. <laughs> you're, you're ready April 12th is what I'm hearing. So we have uh, um, Anthony Coward, the flight chief that's in charge of the school age annex and the CDC off on this, so I got to phone a friend or, or call a friend right right here. Uh, he says we're going to be ready April 12th um, to increase the capacity. You can go register on MCC right now. Uh, and real quick, if I can jump backwards, because I think there was a third part to the prior question, which was, can you do distance learning next year? Um, at the moment, we don't. We we can't for sure say yes or no. What we can say is you will always have the opportunity for uh, independent study. So right now where we have the live teacher teaching in front of a camera, that's distance learning. Uh, but we have offered this year and we will continue to offer independent study which is structured a little bit differently. So if, if that's something you're interested in, uh, I would just say please reach out to your principal and have that conversation. They can kind of walk through how that works and what that is. Uh, but that will be an option, that's an option right now, that'll be an option next year, and, and as of this moment, I see it as being an option in the foreseeable future. Thank you, sir, appreciate you kind of catching that. Do you all have any idea how many students will be in class? Are the classrooms big enough to enforce the three to four foot spacing between each student? Mm -hmm. Classes stay the same as, they've been, as, they, as they have been built, um, and so yes, Although, in some cases, it does require that the desks are, um, they're in elementary, they're in, instead of being in little groups, that they are in straight lines like you'd see in high school. It also may be that, it, that desks are spread out as much as we can in the room. So in the past, we might have left a, a nice little side path so that you could open up the cabinet doors, and instead, desks are all the way up against that edge. And that's not every room, but that could be in some, um, some particular classes. Yeah. That and look and that in way. classrooms where, say, we maybe have a, a smaller number of students, we are increasing the distances where we yes. can. So you know, we'll, we'll, use, we'll use as much of the space available to, to us to ensure that students are as spaced as they can be. Excellent. Again, shifting gears, when will the, when will the school day start and stop? And will there be a day set aside for teacher admin time if so, what day and time? Oh, yeah, like the late start time, late start 
start day? For the rest of this year, we're going to keep a consistent start time. Um, so the same start, so it will, the start time for elementary school will be the traditional start time that we had before. John, what is that? 7.50. 7 7 what time will students be allowed to come and parents start dropping off? So we always open our gates at 7.30 in the morning. So we, we will be open and ready to check your student uh, to make sure that they are okay to come on campus starting at 7.30 in the morning. And those two schools being separated is going to help in that. Now somebody may say, what if I have a kindergartner and I have a sixth grader, um, can I drop them off? At, just drop them off at one spot if that makes it easier for you. But, I'm gonna, but I am going to say the kiss and go lane at Branch, the new Branch Elementary School is much, much, much longer than the kiss and go at Bailey. It's just the way that you could build things. Um, the buildings are offset because of anti-terrorism force protection. They had to be pushed that far in. Um, had to be any brand new building. We didn't do that so that you could get an extra 100 yard walk in every day. They had to do that. And then the parking lots just had to be built the way that they were. We used as much as we possibly could. But a kiss and go really needs to be a kiss and go. Sometimes a parent comes in and it's a, it, it's a kiss and go, it's a hunt for my lost library book, um, get everything together horns are honking behind you kiss and go. We really need it to be a, a very organized come kiss and go and, and get the students through. We will have plenty of adults on site checking temperatures of everybody every day. There's also an app. Brent, would you like to talk about that, sure. please? What we went ahead and did is uh, we implemented this app. It's called the Stop It COVID Screener. Um, we've been implementing it um, with our three special education classes that are currently in person right now. And what happens is every student is enrolled in this app and it will prompt the student or the parent um, every morning around 630 that this COVID screener needs to be completed. It will ask you all the traditional questions you get in regards to a COVID-19 screener. You know, have you come into close contact with an individual with COVID? Are you experiencing headaches, coughs, fever over 100.4, things like that? What will happen is it will prompt you to take it. It really takes no longer than 15, 20 seconds. And in regards you know, to your answers, it'll actually give you a green light, meaning that you're good to go to come onto campus, um, or a red light. Um, if you answer a particular question that could possibly be related to COVID, you'll get a red light. And what happens is the administrators um, will be notified. What will happen for the most part is either the administrator or our school nurse will kind of reach out, kind of have some follow-up questions and really see if that particular symptom is related to COVID. Um, and then kind of go ahead and if it's not related to COVID, go ahead and override it and you're more than welcome to come onto campus. Or if not, um, what we'll do is we'll kind of follow up in regards to your symptoms, set you up for distance learning and kind of go about it that way. And I'll give you an example of something that could be a false positive. Sore muscles, for example, is something that's in there. You have sore muscles. When my son Kevin is 17 years old and he, he you know, wants to, to be Dwayne Johnson, I think. so. He's working out every day. He's got sore muscles every day, but he doesn't have COVID. He just has sore muscles. So technically I could say yes, and my screen will pop up red, but I can tell you why that is. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have that option. Students will be able to at high school come through and show that that thing is green. Principals will be able to see electronically a list. Will we come and you know peel your fingernails off if you don't do this? No, but we're gonna ask you if you would please partner with us and take the 15 or 20 seconds every day and do a quick screen with your child or your children, we will be checking temperature, but we're not gonna ask them about their tummies or sore muscles and things like that. We don't get into that. We will though do a double check on their temperature. And then if throughout the day they come to us and say, I don't feel well, we have the, we've always had sick, you know, the traditional sick room at a school, like the health room. That's at an elementary school, everything from I skin my knee to whatever else, you know. Um, and at high schools, we have those two. It, it usually is different um, for different reasons. But then we also have an isolation room at every school. So if we think it's COVID related, you don't go in the health room, you'll go into an isolation room. Okay. And we'll contact the parent directly immediately. They can come down and get their child and take their child home. Mm -hmm. And they will be nice and spread out. We have filmed examples of those today. Early next week, you will see those come out in the video. Awesome. Okay, so I just want everyone to know that, that there's a difference. We won't 
put your child with a, a bloody nose next to somebody that we think could have COVID, for example. So elementary starts at 7.50. What time does uh, junior senior high start? Yeah, the first period will start at 8.30. However, we will be opening the gates just like for Anton Bailey at 7.30. And we'll be encouraging students who need additional help and tutoring to go to the teachers. So teachers will be available starting at 7.30 for that learning loss mitigation type thing that we've been <coughs> talking about. So they can go in and get additional help, especially in math, mm -hmm. science, or any of the subjects. Um, but then we'll be monitoring them as they're outside on the field until the first period starts at 8.30. 8.30 uh, and band and stuff, it starts at 7.30. Zero period, yeah, zero period if you have band is at 7.30. Okay. Yes. Uh, one thing we do wanna ask parents to help us with uh, more now than ever, uh, but as another problem, uh, we cannot have large groups of children just hanging out. Uh, we have to be able to monitor all the students to make sure they're separated. We can't at, say, four o'clock still have 50 little elementary kids swarming around, or when elementary's out, have them all just hanging out and playing at Desert High School waiting to get picked up. We really are gonna be a lot more strict with that this year. Um, if we really have issues, we'll, we'll ask Edwards to partner with us to help. Uh, so please be very mindful of that. Uh, we want to ensure your children stay safe. And to do that, they have to be monitored. And they can't be monitored if we have them just kind of swarming around Edwards. So, so please, please help us with that. And we're ready to receive right over at the Youth Center uh, after school programs. Um, are we, will we have the, the vans ready to pick up students? They're already ready? So we'll have the vans ready to pick up students to take them over to the school age annex if you are enrolled into that program. Um, and if you're not, you can enroll right now. Uh, there's still capacity. And well, she, well, the, she, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I'm jumping to a different subject, so go ahead. If you want to. Um, there's a, if I was a parent, again, I'd have a follow-up question that says, well, if you're gonna start elementary school at the same time, why aren't you starting high school? I appreciate that you're doing that hour in the morning. Well, what the heck? Um, this has to do with, um, we are a school district. We, we, we have schools in Boron and here. And this has been thrown on us very quickly. And school buses themselves are treated differently. You are not allowed to just put kids, school buses still don't allow at three feet for you to do more than one kid really a seat. So we have to stagger the buses. We don't have a giant fleet of buses, nor do we have bus drivers. And None of us can just go drive a bus. That takes a very specialized license to do that. And so we don't have enough bus drivers or buses to run those routes. So staggering those elementary and high school times that way not only provides an opportunity for the early morning high school students to get some help, but it's the only way that I can transport kids on the other side of the school district. And I'm not gonna do different start times at the two high schools for anybody that wants to ask no. I do similar things for both. It's already different enough as it is. There are things here at Edwards that Boron doesn't have as it is, and I'm not gonna do a different time start. So for the, at least this year, the way it looks, that's the way it is. I really hope that the CDC relaxes enough for us by the time August comes around and things have come back to more of a normal state so that I can run normal bus routes. And if that happens, yes, high schools will start at a traditional time. But for this last few weeks of school and this last, when we come back after April 12th, that will start differently. And that's really driven through transportation more than anything else. I don't know that you get too many complaints for an 8.30 start for a high schooler. I don't think so. <laughs> but, um, I, I just, I try to think. If you to I, nine, <coughs> even you probably right. have to. I just try to think ahead of what questions might pop up. I was up. just gonna ask the boss if I could have an 8.30 start as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so it's, uh, Kind of rolls back into this, the, the youth, and I'm asking it's kind of a specific question scenario-wise, but I think it covers other scenarios that may be existing right now. Folks don't know their, folks just don't know their options. Uh, it says recently our family uh, lost their child care uh, situation. Uh, they have a temporary fix, but it's not going to be able to last long. And they both work here on base, and of course, uh, with us talking about everybody going back to work, eventually they have to have some kind of child care in order to maintain right. and support the mission and do both jobs. Uh, issue is with COVID, they didn't enroll the daughter in school this past year uh, for what should have been her kindergarten year. Uh, now we're told she can't go back to school age or she cannot go to school age care because she's not registered and it's too late in the school year to do so now. She is told, she is too old for the CDC from what we're told. Uh, we need a solution to this. Now I know this is very specific. Uh, they also have a set, one that's six and one is 13 years old. So yes, the six year old is obviously too old for CDC. Uh, but I think we're gonna see 
a lot of this coming up with everybody trying to go back to work and even if it's dual income households and they're not both working on base, folks are stopping teleworking, they're finding jobs again and they're saying, hey, I can't get a job if I don't have childcare. What does it look like for the school age program? What does it look like for CDC? And so kind of two birds with one stone there because I have Anthony in the room and he's smarter than all of us on this. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where I know we need those ready-made solutions. Is it case by case? Is it one of those things where I have to have first sergeants and commanders roll in on that kind of thing? I think part of the question, so to, I know people on, on watching can't hear Anthony, and so I'll, I'll relay. Uh, essentially, we have the capacity, um, and we're, we're ready to, to you know, take these cases on case by case. So you know, come over to the CDC or School Age Annex and talk to the administrators there, and they, they will be more than willing to help you out. I think the, um, the question was not that they weren't enrolled in school, but they weren't enrolled in school age annex yet. Um, so now, can they come register at the school age annex? And the answer is yes. Come on over uh, as you know, schools are coming back, especially if they're coming back and you want to send your kid to school, to kindergarten, you want that after school program, go over to the school age annex and, or get on the uh, militarychildcare.com and uh, check out how to register on, on that site. So I, I think we're good to go with school age annex and CDC. When we reach capacity, um, we'll, we'll send out an uh, announcement to folks as, as that comes. But right now, we're, we're good. So come on over. My apologies. I'm waiting for my phone to catch back up. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Well, One elementary student is going back 100% and they get sick, but they don't, have a they don't have a test positive for COVID. Will they have the option to distance learn while they are recovering? So they're sick, but they don't have COVID and the parent wants to do distance learning? Is that the question? Uh, yes, sir. And, re and re realizing that some of the parents may not use the exact same phrasing that you use as an educator. Yeah. So the way I imagine this is, hey, right now we have the option for our kids who don't want to go back to actually distance learn from home and to get online class, and do the hybrid type thing, um, are they going to be extended that option while that still exists, or are they going to be pushed over into distance learning type of thing? If it's a long term illness versus like hey, my kid is sick for three or four days without COVID. If they're sick for three or four days, they're just going to be sick for three or four days. We'll do the traditional, they just were sick from school. What they will be able to do though that they haven't seen before is they'll still be able to watch that live feed you know, and see, see that right. while it's on and still be a part of it that way. But that's part of that I was talking about, jumping back and forth between. Yeah, so they won't have to <clears throat> not disenroll from that's, in that, person. Nope. No. They'll just watch the live feed and they participate can in class watch and the live come feed, back to class come back. when they're feeling They'll still be, I mean, and if they're absent, they are absent. I mean, absent is still absent. They know that, and that's good because it affords them in our district. For every day you're absent, you get two days to make the work back up. That's very important if you're in high school. So it's, it's that, that work catches, you know, that, that can really accumulate quickly. Mm -hmm. So you'll still keep your seat and everything. You're just a student that's absent mm -hmm. and you'll still be able to watch that class. But um, you will technically be considered, if, if you're enrolled in school and you're sick and you're mm -hmm. at home, just because you watched it doesn't mean that, you know, you keep your perfect attendance or something. You, you are makes, absent. Right. You mm -hmm. are still absent. But you still will get to see, especially if in high school, you, you won't have to miss a beat. In the same vein, I've had three teachers who had COVID since we've been doing distance learning. They taught the entire time. They never missed a beat either. Hmm. They never took a sick leave day or anything. They taught while they had COVID because they were at home. They weren't going to get anybody sick. Um, and they were able to still make it work. But if, but if you are a student that's enrolled <coughs> and you're an enrolled student and you're out and you're sick, you're sick. Cool. Okay, we'll order student, students. I think we kind of answered this earlier, but I want to clarify and sure. make sure we get it right. Will older students need to get vaccines prior to returning? 
I think that really goes to the question of we understand this year, most folks understand this year, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, is there, has there been any talk, and is there any, because there is in the news, and there is around the nation talk of this, I don't know that this happened here, talk based on your answer earlier, I don't know that there is here talk at all of vaccinations being required for students to return next year. I, I meet with superintendents throughout the state regularly and um, legislative advisors as well. I have never heard yet any discussion about requiring students to do so. That being said, we do live in the state of California and they turn on a dime and do things that we that I don't agree with and many others don't agree with. So there could be a day when they do require it, but right now um, they don't, and I have not heard anything about making anyone uh, be required to do it. Yeah, and furthermore, they, they don't even really offer it to, to a lot of students mm -hmm. right now, so. Yeah. Um, well, you have to be 18, I think, to, to get it right Yes, there. sir, and news is talking about some yeah. states are 16 and up. They're, they're opening up to 16 Correct. and up, yeah. and I think that's where a lot of these questions come from. We have military families that yep. don't just watch California, but they see it from yep. other locations. It, it, yeah. But no discussion about that here yet. I haven't heard anything, so that's that's where we're at. The Fair one questions. session's answer is, if we're required to by law, Absolutely. then we will require it. If we're not required to by law, we will not require it. Cool, I like that answer. Yep. <laughs> Okay, I, I think it's more of a visual thing, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably did this on your video. If not, it would have been a good idea. What will the first day back to school look like in regards to children drop off and pick up, especially with the new school layout and the kids not knowing where to go? And, and that's more than just the kiss goodbye line, it's all yeah. the other stuff too. Yeah, do you wanna answer right, yeah. that? Yeah. As part of the videos, we'll, we'll have a map of the school, uh, and we're gonna have some layout and kind of show the flow. Um, and we'll, we'll give you, give the students and the parents and everyone so, some resources in our videos and, and just pictures to, to see what the campus layouts look like and that way you can go. I suspect the first day, just like any first day of school, we'll have a lot of students kind of looking around going, okay, where is 108? 110, one, yeah, that, that's fine. And that's understand, our teachers expect that, our staff expect that, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely provide some resources uh, to the students and the parents. And for the littles, you'll have, I mean, for the elementary school kids, you'll have lots of teachers and, mm -hmm. and other counselors Kids and stuff in the, absolutely. yeah, yeah. We're just to be help out there. them out. It's just gonna be a mm. flood of humanity right. and different things. Actually, I'm in, I'm in court that day for the district, so I won't be there the first day unless I can get it moved. I'm trying to move it just for that reason, just to say it's the first day of school and we have almost every single year been at Bailey. Actually, we've been at, I take it back, Branch, because Bailey didn't exist. Been at Branch on the first day of school because that is the craziest place. Just know everybody, day one, gonna be crazy. It's gonna be crazy and um, uh, as much as I love you, you're gonna contribute to it as well. And it's all of us. It's just the fact that we're there and we're anxious and we wanna be with our kids and because we're all there, it just happens that way. But it will smooth and I would rather go slow and safe mm -hmm. and school start 30 minutes late on day one just because we are slowly getting the kids through mm -hmm. and checking those temperatures and doing it right. Right, and then, on the first day, rush. parents are not allowed to walk their kids to their class. They're not. They're dropping them off. A teacher or faculty mm -hmm. member will help mm -hmm. them get to their class. Yep. Um, will you have maps? Are they posted mm -hmm. already as to where parents go for the kissing drop off? No, not yet, but we will put those out. Okay. Those are coming out as well. Mm -hmm. We're also asking the elementary teachers now that they know what they're gonna be doing, the, um, they will reach out as well. They always do and they, mm -hmm. they'll do some coordinating too as far as what's the afternoon look like and how do we hand them back off to you. Mm -hmm. So um, I can talk all day long and then um, Mrs. or Mr. fill in the blank is going to probably come up with something way better has already talked to their parents and or will and they'll work that part out. Um, but if there's any concern and as it gets closer and closer and you're saying, come on man, nothing's happening here. These are the two gentlemen I please reach out to first and, and have that conversation with and we will get the answer to you. But maps, videos, all of that. We're trying to think of everything and be as transparent and also create it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So we're also building the box as we're doing this. Right. We're building the plane and flying it. And once we've, once we've posted these, if there's something that, hey, I really need to know something, reach out to your principals and uh, we can always make a quick update or, or release a little additional information if it's something that, that you folks need. Like that. 
Okay. Is there a threshold for if there are a number of active cases in the school? Question one. Question two, what happens if Kern County moves back to the purple tier? Let's say these together because they're kind of connected. Mm -hmm. One, is there a planners or a threshold for schools to go, no, 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 we might not be purple, but. Sure. And then two, what if the entire county goes back to purple? Brent, you wanna talk to that? Sure. So there's a particular threshold um, in regards to the California Department of Public Health guidance and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so if there is three active COVID cases in a particular school, they consider that um, an outbreak. What occurs is um, Kern County Department of Public Health automatically jumps in and we start consulting with them in regards to what we need to do. That's where our nurses, our admins, we start doing the contact tracing. Um, we, looked at, we, we look at, you know, um, the way we look at contact tracing is if, you know, the positive case has been around an individual within that three feet as well as for more than a 15 minutes in a given day. And then we'll kind of go from there as well too. Um, so that's kind of the gist of it. Um, does the school close? At what point does the school close So down? in regards to an outbreak, we would have to consult with uh, Kern County Department of Health, but for the most part, if it's considered and defined as an outbreak, usually schools will close. How long do they close for? Um, it would depend, but usually they um, side on the side of caution, and it's usually about 14 days. Then they come back in. Yeah. Right. There's been a lot of talk on that, Chief, and it's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I even made some announcements early on and talked about how one family could kill the whole district mm -hmm. down, shut us all down. Um, they, uh, some cooler heads have prevailed in this. Um, it is more sensible. Um, there's consultation with the health department um, if we start to see some cases. What we haven't seen in the nation are cases from kids as much as we do adults. And also, um, statistically speaking, across the nation, it hasn't been schools that have caused outbreaks, but it's been behaviors outside of the school right. that then are brought in. So uh, the best thing to do to help the schools to stay open um, is to be mindful of that as families and to stay safe and um, practice practice good things in your home as well. And on, honestly, that, that helps more than anything else. We'll do everything that we can do, but I can't control what happens once that three o'clock hour hits until they come back the next morning. And uh, yeah. okay. my understanding is if we do, what, as once we have reopened, even if the county does move back into purple, okay. we will remain open. We will remain open. Okay, mm -hmm. good, yes. that's a very important yeah. note that I think they were getting at. Um, what will recess look like? Will kids be allowed to play at a safe distance with kids from different classes? They will. During recess. They will, and we'll see some more guidance on that and relaxation, I'm sure, as we go. Right now, they're not, uh, they can share equipment. In other words, they can play on, you know, similar things and whatnot. Um, we will be constantly wiping things down as well. Um, they can play with other kids, but they're also supposed to maintain a safe distance from one another. So um, there, there's both of those. They're not going to huddle up in little groups, but we can organize a cool kickball game and we can do other things like that. We can play four square, quite honestly, because and share a ball. Whereas a month ago, we were told that for basketball practice, every kid had to write a name on the ball and they couldn't even share a hoop. So we've gone from that to at least now we can do these other things. I would say the elementary do expect to see the class stay together much more than it ever has. They, they will be the single cohort um, much more just so in the event that one kid does test positive, yeah. that group is the one that's impacted it. We don't have to, to try and contract trace multiple classrooms. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's difficult to read the tone over these questions. It would make sense that that's kind of what that tone may have been about is, um, are we, are we ed hedging on the side of caution or are we taking a little bit of risk where it's necessary? Because like we talked about with you know, the social needs and what have you, some extra maybe we're a different class. On caution. But, in some ways, there's a balance there, and I think that's yeah. a good balance of it. Yeah, we're hedging um, on caution. I'm going to go back a little bit here because uh, somebody brought up a really good point. We are talking about something earlier, and to be honest, I am really can't even speculate the answer to this. Okay. Um, but I know it's probably been addressed. When we started taking lockers out of schools and we started saying kids will carry everything, they have Chromebooks, so they're carrying less textbooks mm -hmm. probably. But what about uh, children with medical needs such as scoliosis and things of that mm -hmm. nature where they can't carry those things all day long? 
where's that solution? In a pre-COVID world, what we have done and what we did at Boron High that really helped a lot was we created class sets of books so that kids didn't have to worry about carrying them around. And there was just a set of books in the classroom and then each child checked out a book and they just had a book at home. Sure. We can still do that for kids that have scoliosis, mm -hmm. those rare cases that's, that we can still do that even in a post-COVID world, I can make that happen. If you have a condition like that, you need to reach out to the principal um, and we will, we will work with that. Find a ready-made solution yeah. for their particular situation. We can yeah, make, right. we, we try to make anything happen for kids. It's just, yeah. yeah and this is for any, any student with any significant mm -hmm. serious medical issue. Uh, you know, obviously there's documentation required, notes and that, but uh, any student that has any medical issue such as that, uh, we have always been accommodating and will always continue to be accommodating. It's good, good reassuring, though. It's yep. good reassurance for you Absolutely. guys to say that. Absolutely. Um, here's a question I would have asked as a parent. Are we doing school pictures this year? Yeah, and they've been How doing, doing some already. My, yeah. my, uh, my seniors just took them. theirs, and I saw them last night. I, um, actually, yeah. my wife did. I haven't seen them yet. I, I just lied. Um, she just said they looked really good. <laughs> my daughter was happy about it. She's so, in practice. Is this a and screenshot smile. of her Zoom? What is it? What's no, it look no, like? No, no, real, real, real deal picture for the seniors. Um, principals, can we talk a little bit about pictures? Going, but no, yeah. we have not done them so far this year, but we are in the process of getting that going. Oh, so some have, some have, and that's probably where the question comes from. Then. Yeah, and yeah. Actually, that's just did it. We already did our makeups, and seniors already had their pictures done as well through you have some yearbook, stuff, so, uh, done, so for your photo that goes in the yearbook, it right. also goes on yeah, your yearbook. Yeah. That's already that's all been done. done. That's my ninth grader that went and got hers done. We've, all, we've also <laughs> found what's really interesting is so now that everybody's back, things like that are. Um, it's almost first come, first serve. Everybody's fighting for these same services. Mm -hmm. There's only so many life touch photographers out oh, there. Mm -hmm. You know, and all the schools come back and they, sell, they all want the same thing. So um, as much as we can give them, we are. Um, I have been asked about some traditional things that I just can't do it. Like I can't provide every single senior experience and dance and everything. I can't, I, I've got to. Um, I'm, I'm dying on the hill of getting him educated, <laughs> first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I try to provide experiences, but we are having a graduation. It will be at Desert High School's brand new stadium. Um, mm -hmm. And the seniors have asked that it be at dusk. Um, they want Friday night lights. And we're gonna do a Friday night lights. <laughs> it's gonna be beautiful. And uh, yeah. I expect the winds will blow 80 miles an hour, but you know what? That's I don't fun. care what it does. That's what they want. And we're gonna yep. get them out there. It's gonna be a great it's graduation. Be there than the flight line. Yes. Okay, so, um, <laughs> sir, for you, is the base now open for everyone to include retirees five days a week since school is starting back up? So, not yet. Um, we're we're talking about, and so at that point for retirees, right? That's it's been posted out there on the Edwards Air Force Base site. Uh, at what condition, HPCon condition, do we go to five days a week for retirees? Uh, we just added Fridays. So Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are the current retiree days, and then obviously holidays and non-duty days. Uh, so sometimes we'll have family days and, and that's a non-duty day. Uh, but if we go to HPCon Alpha, that is when retirees will be on um, all the time because we'll pretty much go back to normal uh, operations on base uh, and we are heavily considering that watching the COVID cases in California very very closely uh, to make sure that we don't jump the gun on on this right now we got spring break coming up uh, don't know what that's going to look like as far as any kind of spikes or anything like that but um, General Higer is, is talking to all of his commanders and and watching all the news to make sure that uh, he has an informed decision on when we go back to HPCon Alpha. Uh, if retirees need to bring students to school, are they allowed to just Absolutely. drop off kids? But Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So if you're a retiree and you have kids in school, you'll be allowed on base to drop your kids off at school. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one quick question. Um, for points of clarification, Children using the gator mask. Is a CDC compliant, can they use it? And that's the one that goes around your neck that has the funny face on it that you can just go from here and pull it up over your nose and wear it like that. 
You know, is that CDC compliant? Is it something they can use in the schools? Is it something they can use the CDC and school age program? The, those are fair questions. Do we have a, a particular style brand of mask that we're requiring them to use? Does it have to be behind the ears? What does it look like? It needs to cover the mouth and the nose, and a uh, gator mask is fine. Um, I don't see any problem with that. We have plenty of masks as well if a student loses their mask. Um, if it looks like it's nice and cloth and beautiful and whatnot, we'll put it in a lost and found if somebody would like to retrieve it. Um, uh, but we also have uh, it just hunt, we have thousands and thousands of masks. We're going to be everybody's going to have masks on them, and if a child loses a mask, we'll give it to them. But if a child, um, especially as they get older, if they if they refuse to wear the mask and they keep pulling it off, um, I will send them home to distance learning, and they will finish the year doing distance learning. Uh, for the type of mask, though, I would I suggest because um, for us military folks on. Edwards, the ones with the valve, those are not authorized. Okay. So those uh, all actually allow spittle or mm. you know uh, particles to actually escape. So th those type of valves are not allowed. So I'd recommend Good the enough. parents not get those type of masks for your children. Um, not saying that they're not allowed for them because I don't think we can dictate to to the kids on base, but uh, for for us military folks and civilians working on base, those types of masks aren't allowed. And Mr. Coward? Yeah. Mm. No exit valve, right? Yeah. No exit right. valve allowed for his. For school age program and CDC. Well, if the, for for Edwards, those who didn't hear it. Edwards, you have to cross Edwards to get to the schools, so right. no, uh, no valves. By extension. We're, yeah, we're, we're fine with that. Okay. Also, uh, the rare sensory child that just can't can't do it, mm. you can be allowed to use a face shield. It's supposed to have a bib underneath. Mm. Um, but anyway. Um, like a netted bib or like a hanging? Like a hanging. Okay. And I, I, if you get into it, there's all sorts mm. of debate about tucking it in or not tucking it in right. or where it sits. And I don't know that if there's, I'm on TV, I'm trying to be careful, Chief, but I don't know, if the, sir. I don't yeah. know if the shield police are coming around. Mm. I, I'm saying. I, I just, we need them to have something mm -hmm. on, and we do expect people to, to adhere to something. And once again, for those like kids that. that have needs like that or special needs, it should mm -hmm. be documented, yes. shown to you, right. through mm -hmm. the counselor's administration, and then we'll work it out from there. Absolutely. Cool. Sir, do we cut off at 1730, or can we keep, what's our? Yeah, do you have a lot more questions? Yes, sir. So we'll, we'll have to get those questions out and answer them, because we have quite a few more. I can stop talking 95 sentences just to say one thing, I, I promise. All right, see if we can get through a couple more questions. I'll give you a lightning round. round. We'll do a lightning round. Lightning round. We've we got we go. five minutes. I'm going to answer go. fast. Yeah. There you go, Chief. If you, still have active, if you still have active requests for care with the school age program, when can we expect to hear back on getting some space? If, we, if we're still actively enrolled in the school age program, but not currently going, we can we expect to hear, hey, yes, you're active, you're enrolled, we know you're enrolled, you can come back now. So still, all right, still going to MCC, registry kids for the school year. And if that doesn't answer your question efficiently, please stop by and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely. If not, you can email anthony.coward at us.af.mil. <laughs> Yeah, if you're already enrolled, you'll be fine, is what Anthony just relayed. Okay, please clarify what grades are going to what school. Uh, Branch, uh, Bailey Elementary School is transitional kindergarten through third grade. Branch Elementary School is fourth through sixth grade. Desert Junior Senior High School, seventh through twelfth grade. We are hiring a new principal for Bailey Elementary School. Also, um, just so we can clarify, uh, once again, I think everybody knows this, but the desert is going to the old branch. They're not going to what is currently set up, the old desert senior no, high. In fact, half of it's gone now. It's mm -hmm. been demolished and it's yeah. disappeared. So they're going to the old branch. And we will post maps. We will post maps. That's the big thing. Yep. When do, we keep talking about when school starts. When does it actually end? What time? Not day, we know that's what oh, day that is. What, what time? Uh, elementary school ends at 2.15. High school ends at 3 o'clock. Can, can high school students stay on campus after school like previous years? You mean just hang out on our campus like they did in previous years? Cool, well, sir. Yes. Uh, we ask that parents no. please not do that. <laughs> We've been asking that, so I would say no. 
Well, we're trying to keep everybody safe. No, they need to have a place to go. Are there any after-school programs that anybody would be involved in? After-school mm. clubs or? No, if they're involved in a club, yeah. a sport, 100% right. they can stay. Yes. But if you're asking me, can I just have my kid hang out on your property until I get done at work at five, we've always asked you not to please, please don't do that. And now, especially with COVID, please don't do that. So that was a rule pre-COVID. It's always been a rule. Still a we're rule just, now. Enforcing just more, more, more important. Uh, a difference of manpower, being able to enforce and press right. them off the campus right. is a different story. Yes. Mm -hmm. So making sure the resources are there. What would the exact school day schedule look like on a daily basis for my first grade distance learner? The current schedule online is from 8.30 to 9.30 and 10 to 11 every day. Will that schedule stay close, anywhere close to that? Speak to your teacher. Call your teacher. Speak to the teacher. Make sure we call the teacher independently. Now look for different for each one. I think, I think you just answered what time school will be ending for junior high and high school. I'm trying to go lightning around here, so I'm pulling up ones I just haven't opened yet. Is the annex going to open up to more families now that the schools are opening? Some families are unable to come in person due to lack of access to child care. So I think the question is now that we're opening everybody else, do we increase our employment so we increase student ratio? Yeah, so we're, we're ready for surge capacity on for the school age annex. Cool. How will you address mental and behavioral issues of students based on these changes and how it will affect them? And please keep in mind, I know there's a traditional way of doing that, but I think this is a, with respect to the current environment situation and mental, mental health environment, how are we going to address those issues as they come back when it comes to being overwhelmed with emotion and overwhelmed socially anyway? Very gently, personally, one on one, and if you as a parent feel that you're not that your child's not receiving what they need, please let us know so that we can fill in any gaps and holes. We'll do anything and everything that we can legally and ethically do for your children. And you'll have plenty of counselors. Uh, on, we, at we've the got schools. them available. We have counselors at school. Teachers have been trained right. on this. Right. We have we even have after school wraparound for those that are the most severe, and we have had that in the past, mm -hmm. and we'll continue with that. Um, Brent, yes, real fast. We have a school psychologist on hand as well, too, that need a little bit more intensive intervention. Um, we have school psychologists with um, MFT credentials as well, too. So, so marriage and family counseling services. Um, and we've been kind enough, Edwards Air Force bases, even in the past, also provided mm -hmm. some additional right. support. So we have a military family life consultant mm -hmm. uh, rep as well. Yes. Candace Lang has worked that out. She has. Um, Thank you very much, Candace. To the school, so. And if, you, if I don't mind adding, if a student's on an IEP, we can always offer educationally related mental health services through our county as well. So that's another added layer of support there. We are very, very mindful of that. And mm -hmm. you tell me what you need for your kid. And 760-250-3210 or come down at the end of Desirita in North Edwards and come find me at 16976. That's where I live and we'll do everything we can for your child. Cool. Okay, sir, as it's traditional with every lightning round, it went longer than it was supposed to. And the last question goes to the host, so this is for you. Will retirees need a letter or anything that says they are picking up a child at school? I have grandparents who pick up my children. That is a good question that I don't think so. Um, if they have the kid in the car, obviously that's a big um, clue to our gate guards that they're dropping off a kid at the gate. So. We're going to have to clarify the, the rest of that because um, when they come pick up, it's going to be less obvious uh, that they're coming to pick up a kid. So let me, let's, we'll get the answer from Joe Binkarowski on what, what is it going to take to allow them access to the base. Well, yes, sir. Un, unencumbered. Last thing I want is for them to get to the gate and get stopped. So. Exactly. And for any questions we didn't answer, they can always send it to uh, uh, 412th MSG org box and send it to me, daniel.thompson.8 at us.af.mil. And if you didn't get your questions answered today, please send it to me and we'll get them answered later on. Uh, sir, with that, turn it back over to you and we'll get All to the right. rest of these as I can. Awesome. All right. So gentlemen, again, once again, thank you for, mm -hmm. for joining us. Uh, lots of questions this time, but it's a, it's a different time and, you know, going back to school is an exciting thing. But it's also a, a nerve wracking thing yeah. for a lot of parents out there. So I appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, to hopefully assuage some fears out there that what we're doing is is safe and you know we can send kids back to school and we, we can at least for the last six weeks and we're going to get
get some goodness out of this. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate everything you guys do on a daily to take care of our kids and our mm -hmm. families. Thank you. And with Thanks that, so we'll sign off.